So now we are going to get into a fairly big topic. And okay, so now we're going to talk a lot about dynamic linking, meaning importing functions from other uh, other programs. So we talk about static linking versus dynamic linking. Static linking is that stuff that's done at compile time. So it's compiled and then it's linked, right? And the linker is supposed to take all of these object files and put them back together. And if the linker then is told explicitly, excuse me, if the linker is told static link my file, what it's going to do is it's going to go and run around and find all of the functions that you use. And whereas normally it would say like, okay, we'll figure that out later at runtime. If you static link the file, it'll say take all of the functions and libraries that I depend on and build those all into one big fat binary. And so we'll see that later on at the Linux uh, side of things. We'll show you know, the relative sizes of static link versus dynamic link. But, uh, but the big point of dynamic linking is that it's about efficiency. So you don't want to have these giant binaries that include all of the libraries and everything like that. That has security implications like if you uh, you know, basically embed this DLL into your EXE and that DLL is found to have a bug and Microsoft patches the DLL, you know, do you know that there's a bug and did you update your EXE? Did you re-statically link it? You can have you know, vulnerable code hanging around in programs when you have static linked files. Beyond that, there's this issue that I kind of alluded to before where the OS is saying if you know, Notepad has kernel32.dll loaded into its memory, and Explorer has kernel32 loaded into its memory through dynamic linking. Dynamic linking by having these separate files makes it so that you can use memory more efficiently. You can say, I'm going to have one copy of kernel32 in physical RAM, and I'll map that into the virtual memory of two different processes, and I basically save space by only using the physical RAM that I need to. <clears throat> so, uh, we're basically going to get into imported functions in great detail. There's basically three different forms of importing functions that we're going to talk about. I'll call the first one just normal imports. But uh, the key thing is that you as a programmer, you write something like, I'm going to write printf, and, and it's just, you know, you don't typically worry about how it actually gets into your code, right? But the point here is we're digging deeper into programs. And so if you took something like intro x86 class, you'd, you'd see things like, okay, well, the printf is actually implemented by, there's a call instruction, and it calls to some particular data location, and it's using that square brackets, again, that I told you about. Square bracket means go to memory at that address and pull up some value. And so what it's actually doing with this call is it's saying there's this location 4182BC. It's going to go to that location, and it's going to pull out a value, and then it's going to use that value for the place that it's going to call to. So it's going to go to some other location. So it's not calling to the address 4182BC. It's going to that, pulling out a value, and saying, I'm going to go to that. And so in the intro x86 class, you wouldn't know, like, why is it pulling something out of a table and calling to that? Why is it not just put the address where it wants to call to? And so here we're going to talk about imports. This turns out to be an import address table, so it's a big list of addresses. <coughs> Big list of addresses that are used to call external functions. And so it says to show imports, but I think we'll get that done from the game. All right, so from the optional header to the data directory, this is our first place where we're digging into the data directory. So this is index one in the data directory. It's called image directory entry import. And I said that every single entry in the data directory, they're all the same. They're all just an RVA and a size. So it's trying to tell you Here's the RBA of the data structure that has import information in it. And then here's the size of that data structure. So in this case, it's particularly important because in this case, what it's pointing at is an array of multiple of this particular data structure. So we're going to call this the import descriptor, or we'll sometimes call it the, what was the other name we called it? Import, yeah. So each of these is called an import descriptor, obviously, based on uh, on this particular name, but we're going to call the array of these import descriptors either the import descriptor table, or sometimes we'll just call it the import directory. So what we do a lot in this class is that whatever is pointed to by the data directory, we're going to call that the import directory, or maybe the export directory, or the TLS directory, and things like that. I'm kind of telling you that more for game purposes. So later on, if I ask about the import directory, 
you know, I'm talking about the thing pointed to by this data directory entry. If I ask you about the PLS directory, I'm talking about something pointed to by the data directory. Anyways, we've got an RVA and a size. The RVA is going to point at an array of these data structures. And the size obviously should tell us like what the total size of, you know, if we've got five of these data structures, the size should be five times the size. But in reality, this is actually a null terminated array. So there's, you know, for instance, three of these, and then there's an entry that's this big, but it has all zeros in it. So it's a null terminated array of data structures, basically. All right, and from here, though, oh, okay, I don't go into that, but um, there's, so starting at that first array, the key thing we care about for these import descriptors is that there's going to be one of these per DLL that you're importing from. So that's the first thing. Start from the import information, it says, all right, here's DLL A that I import from, here's DLL B, here's DLL C. And which DLL it is is going to be specified by the name. So that's nice and easy, you can get that out of the way. We've got three fields, one of them is the name, it's just saying this imports from kernel32.dll. The name is going to be an RPA. But then the trickier part are these names that are not entirely intuitive. So, and this is broken. You know, fix that. So their data structure is basically, this is another typo in the winnt.h, and it's a little more unfortunate in this case. This first thing called original first thunk, there's going to be something called the INT import names table. So this is going to be an array that points at a bunch of names for now the functions that you're importing from this particular DLL. And then this first thunk thing, this is going to point at an array of the addresses, the actual import address table, the IAT. And these are the addresses that correspond to the names that are imported from this particular thing. So this is what I just said. Original first thug, I don't really expect you to memorize that original first thug is the INT and first thug is the IAT. In all of your tools, it'll basically either say this is the import names table or this is the import address table. So I don't even usually worry about the original first thug versus first thug. But unfortunately, things are not so simple that we just have like a pointer to, well, I mean, it, it is what it has to be. This is going to point at some other data structures which are going to actually point at our names. So this is where we get quite, uh, quite indirect. And the first thunk is going to point directly at, well, it's going to point at a data structure. I don't even, I'll, I'll go there when I show you the picture. So again, this entry is the data directory entry. This is the import descriptor. And then those two fields in here point at these other arrays, and these are arrays of image thunk data. And these are unions, which make it even nastier. So it can be, you know, one of these things. It can be forward or string, function, ordinal, address of data. Again, back to this. First, we've got one per DLL sort of data structure. And for each DLL, it points at two things. One of them is pointers to names. One of them is addresses. Each of those pointers to names or addresses, though, is actually going to look like one of these image think thunk datas. And the main thing is, when it's a pointer to a name, it's this case right here, p image import by name. So if it's a pointer to a name, we're going to interpret this as a pointer to yet another structure. The structure which has a hint, which is going to say like, hey, maybe this is import number you know, 500 in the export table of that DLL, and then an actual name. So it'll be more clear once we see the raw data structure. But basically, it's a word. It's a two-byte thing saying, look, this function can maybe be looked up by going to index 500 in the export table of somewhere else. Or if that turns out to not work out for you, then here's the actual string. So yeah, let's just uh, keep rolling. So these are the two interpretations of that thunk data that we care about. In one case, it's a function, which is a pointer to a D word. So it's literally just this entire thing is really just one D word. And it's actually an address of printf, for instance. The other case is, so that if this is the import address table, this thing will basically be just an address of printf. If it's the import names table, it'll be a pointer to that other data structure where it'll have number and then the, the literal string printf. 
So that's kind of what I just talked about. Hint is going to be a number, and then name is going to be the actual string that you're talking about. So I. Yeah. So all I want to say is that, okay, first I want to kind of show you the picture to start, uh, start making this a little more concrete. So, Bill, can I get the uh, video up on the screen and the we'll stuff out? Thank you. All right, so we start out in the data directory, and it's going to point us at this, you know, import descriptor table, import uh, directory table, whatever. You've got an array of these sort of data structures, one per DLL. In this case, I have exactly one DLL that I'm importing from, one EXE that I'm importing from. I probably should change this around to make it more user space, but when I originally wrote these, I was very more kernel focused. So you can actually import functions from NTOS kernel.exe. So there's like how.dll imports from NTOS kernel, and NTOS kernel imports from how.dll. So in the kernel, it's all very incestuous with these three functions importing from each other, but um, so I'm going to, well, no, I don't want to change it because otherwise that won't be accurate. All right, so you've just got something saying which module it is, doesn't necessarily have to be a DLL, which binary you're importing functions from. In this case, this would be something importing a function from NQS kernel. Then we said the only two things we care about are the original first thump and the first thump. So this one, is the pointer to the import names table. So the top thing points to the import names table. And all it is is an array of D words. So each of those is a D word. And the D word is one of these unionized image thump data stuff. So it has the multiple interpretations. But whenever it's an import names table, we interpret this as pointing to a hint and a name. Let me just go back one quick. All right, so I said, if we're pointing at the import names table, we interpret it as pointing as a p import by name kind of thing. So the names table treats it like that. And when it's a import by name, it's going to be pointing at a hint and just a string. Basically, it says, you know, like it's one byte, but they're just doing that for structure definition purposes. So it's not really just one byte name. It's a two byte hint saying, hey, you can probably find this guy at export address table index 14b, but then if it goes and tries to look at export address table 14b and it says, okay, let me compare the string there to this string, and it says, nope, those don't match, then it'll say, okay, well now I need to just go search the other guy's export address table to try to find this string. And obviously we'll talk about export address tables next, but really you can just think of export address tables as a big list of here's my function name, here's the address, here's the function name, here's the address. So there has to be this matching between this guy wants to import printf, and this guy exports printf, right? So there has to be this, these two tables that say, hey, I export printf, and it's right here. And there's this guy saying, I want printf, and where can I find it? So import names table points at int string data structure. Now here's the kind of weird thing about the uh, normal imports on Windows. The import address table starts out on disk also pointing at the exact same int name structure. Now, we know that the import address table is supposed to eventually contain the real address of IO delete symbolic link, for instance. So basically, the difference between what's on disk and what's in memory is that when you load up the program, the OS loader's job is to fill in this table. It goes and it like tries to look up the address of this, and then it fixes up this table so that it has the actual address. So this is it on disk, and this is it in memory. After the OS loads things, but you would see if you go in memory and you're you know, parsing these data structures in memory, the import names table will still be pointing at these hints and strings inside of its own file information. But the import address table at runtime will contain the actual address in NQS kernel where you can find IO delete symbolic link RTL Unicode string, and so forth. So I know this is you know, very, very circuitous and lots of work. We've gone from zero levels of data structure where you just look at the data structure and you say, OK, there's the value. So now we've got you know, three levels of data structure. But uh, 
Any first level questions on this? We'll be kind of going over it a couple times. Any first questions about how this importing system with one thing per DLL goes to a list of functions, how that list of functions gets resolved at lunch time? All right. So, so here's an example I just put into the thing. I can show it in the thing right now. But we're looking at, uh, I guess, I probably took that original example from null.sys, kernel driver, doesn't really do anything. And so if you were in uh, P view and you went down, they're calling the import directory table. Like I said, sometimes I call it import descriptor table, import directory table. We've got each of these image import descriptors. And we've got a null terminating kind of thing. So null.sys imports only from NTS kernel.exe. We care about this because this is an RVA that points us at the names table. And we care about this because this is an RVA that points us at the address table. Okay. Now we're going on to the more complicated case, right? So that was just import from one thing, but in reality, most stuff is going to import from multiple DLLs, right? Multiple uh, modules. So how this works is that, again, we just have one of these data structures per thing that you're importing from. And then these don't necessarily have to be in the same order as we kind of see right here. So in this case, NTX kernel may come here first, but its entries are right here. And this is kind of high memory, low memory. So it has, uh, wait, how many low memory? Sorry, low memory, high memory. So it's this one, then this one, then this one. These are all NTX kernels. Whereas when we go down to HAL and we follow its original first one, so this is HAL, this is HAL, this is HAL. So, don't expect that just because you see entries like NTS kernel then HAL, that you can say, oh, well, this is NTS kernel and this is HAL. It doesn't have to be in order. It's just in whatever, it's at whatever offset these things actually point at. So again, just one name per thing. And then you follow the things up to the import names table. And these are the functions that this particular thing is importing from HAL.dll. Actually, use fast text and so forth. These are the functions imported by and, and imported from NTS kernel. That's what it looks like in memory, and this is what it looks like in, or sorry, that's what it looked like in disk, this is what it looks like in memory. The only difference is, whereas originally they both point at the same data structure, once you actually load it up, that table gets filled in with the function pointers to these particular functions. All right, so I guess this was beep.sys that I loaded, the, the second most simple kernel driver after null.sys. So beep.sys imports from NTS kernel and hal.dll, and it's got its particular you know, entries where it says, here's where I want you to look up the function names that I'm importing, and here's where I want you to place the function addresses once you've resolved them. So if we were to dig down further into, uh, into beep.sys, so we were originally looking at the import directory. Now we go and Back in the import directory, I think we're going to say, so import names table, or sorry, import address table, is that RBA 798. So we're going to go there and we're going to see what does the import address table point to on disk. So we go to you know, 798, for instance. This is the import address table on disk. It's still, so this is the RBA of this field, and this field holds a hint, or sorry, this field holds an RBA to a hint and a string. So we would have to go to 9AC, and if we went to that RBA, then we would see a hint and a string. I don't know if I even have that slide next. 9AC? No, I don't. So let's do it with some real things. I'll show you the difference between PU and uh, Safe App Explorer. We'll go with something hopefully easy, like Notepad. You can follow along or not, but right here I'm just trying to show uh, the difference in how you see the import information. So uh, I can't do Notepad because Notepad is not a normal import. Uh, and I think last time, yeah, I found one that had normal imports last time, and then it was on my VM, but it wasn't on these machines. So I think I'm going to have to go with one of mine. Isn't it because it, you've got DLL there instead of you have? No, no, it was um, the thing is. 
most everything uses a different form of importing that I'll talk about next. And so Notepad, I know, uses this non-normal importing. But yeah, I can pick pretty much anything. And, uh, let's see if this any import something. All right. So, so how you would, you know, how PEView is getting all this information is it, you know, goes to the optional header, goes down to the data directory, goes down to the data directory, index one as the import table, and it says import table information is at RBA two 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 four, and then that's going to be, you know, some. It, it looks up, you know, okay, well, the R data section starts at 2,000, so and it goes to 2,600 or 25D4, so 2224 is somewhere between 2,000 and 25D4. So somewhere in the R data information at RBA 2224, RBA 2224, there's going to be these arrays of this one per DLL sort of import. And so in this case, my template 32 naturally imports from MSVCR 100 FDLL. That's the Microsoft Visual C runtime uh, DLL for Visual Studio, basically. So it's the Visual Studio C runtime that it imports from, and kernel 32 that it imports from. So now, if I wanted to know, you know, what functions does it actually import from Visual Studio runtime, I would go to the import names table, for instance. And so 22A4, that's where I got to go next, but I can just kind of cheat. And I can go right here. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, is that okay for a moment? Oh, no. 22A4 is right here, but again, don't assume they're in the right order. So 22A4, the MSVCRT is actually below the kernel 32. So these are all the kernel 32 ones, and these are the MSVCRT. So uh, you know, we can see, there we go, there's printf, for instance. We can see that one of the entries in the import names table is a thing that points at offset 2308, and it's just interpreting this for you. It's trying to make things easier for you, but obviously, you know, when, it's, when you're dealing with three levels of indirection and stuff, it can still be confusing. So the real value at 2300 is just the number 2308. But then PEView said, OK, well, now I'm going to go to 2308. And since I know that you're looking at an import names table, I will interpret that as pointing to a hint and a string. So 2308, we've got to go into this big array of stuff right here. 2308, oh, how nice. It's the first one. So the hint is two bytes, 05D7, right there at the beginning at 2308, 05D7. And then the string is P R I N T N. Over here in the string view on the side. Got printed. So basically, again, directory table gives you all of the DLLs you're importing from. From each of those, you can go to an address table and a names table. The thing is, the address table and the names table point at the exact same thing. Uh, in Well, they point at, uh, let's see if they point at the same thing here. People are trying to keep track of you if you switched over here. Your address view to uh, yes. RBA. Yes. So actually, if you are trying to follow along, I, I guess I didn't I didn't uh, highlight this one. I, did I run PEV? I don't think I showed you CFF Explorer in the morning. I should have showed you more on PEV. One of the uh, nice things about PEV versus uh, CFF Explorer is there's these little arrows at the top where you can change from file offsets to offsets, which is just like offset relative to whatever thing you're currently in. And then RVAs, that's extremely useful when you're bouncing around like this. And then VAs, which is where they just add in base address to whatever the RVA was. So later on, I would think there's some questions where they ask you, like, you know, what's the file offset of this particular thing? Or what's the RVA of this thing? What's the VA of this thing? Well, the nice thing is if you can parse that particular question with P view, you can just, you know, move around. If you can't, you have to do it the hard view. It, it, if I ask you for a file offset and you can't do it with PEView, you get to do it the hard way, which is you go into the section, you figure out which section a given RVA or VA stand is within, and then you have to like take the uh, pointer to raw data. And so like, let's say I have the address 1100, right? And I say, what's the file offset of 1100? Well, we know that 1100 
is going to be 100 into this dot text section. Right? So this dot text section starts at 1,000. 1,100 is 100 into that. Then you have to figure out the pointer to raw data is 400. So 1,000 in memory is 400 in disk, plus 100 for both of them. So 1,100 is 500 in disk. So let me show an example of that. Let's see. Uh, Right, 1,000, 100, right? And if I go click file offset, 500, right? So it does it for you all nice and happy like, but if you can't do it with this, then you have to do it the hard way, which is just figure out where it is in a given section, figure out the offset into the section, figure out where that section is in file, and then add the offset in memory to the offset to the start of file. Anyway, it's a little digression. But, um, so, yeah, so what I wanted to show you basically was app verif.exe, which is something I found online, which I don't know, we'll check if it's here, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't on the other lab machine, so it's probably not going to be here. Yeah, not here. That's fine. So, all, all the real point was just to show you these are quote, what I'm going to call normal imports. It normally imports the import address table and the import names table. Both have the same field right here, have the same data in this data field. They both are pointing at the same data structure. That data structure is that thing that was in the middle of that picture that has a hint and a name. And so they both just have RBAs pointing at this thing that has a hint and a name. All right. So, I, well, let's see. So one thing I was going to say had I opened the app verif.exe was um, something just as general knowledge, not relevant to the quiz, but relevant to when you're actually trying to use these tools in the real world. <clears throat> so on 64-bit systems, system 32 is actually where 64-bit binaries are installed. And SysWow64 is where 32-bit binaries are installed. They were trying to go for like backwards compatibility because on Windows XP and you know 32-bit systems, you just put everything in System32, right? The problem is the coders just you know continued with like everything goes in System32, and so uh, yeah, they were trying to go for making things easier on some people, but they're making things harder on us. So anyways, it, PEView itself is a 32-bit binary. When a 32-bit binary tries to open um, let's see which way does it go. When 32-bit binary tries to open the syswow64 directory, it'll actually be redirected to. Wait, no wait. I'm explaining this wrong. Yeah. Wait. Okay. Sorry. If you're in PE view and you try to open system 32, which holds the 64-bit binaries, it says, oh, you're a 32-bit binary. You don't really want all these new, so this is where the backwards compatibility comes, right? You're a 32-bit binary. You don't really want the system 32 directory, because that's where we store all of our 64-bit binaries now. So let me just redirect you back to what you want. You want the 32-bit copies of binaries, which I store in syswow64. So if you try to open uh, something with PE view, which is 32-bit, and we open system32 slash, let's go with aaclient.dll. You can see this parse is all nice and the optional header works out because I just opened something in system32 which should have the 64-bit binaries because that makes sense. And But I got a 32-bit binary. What you have to actually do if you want to really open system32 with the 32-bit binary and really open 64-bit things is there's this other sort of little uh, redirection. You have to go Windows, SysNative, and then whatever, a client.exe, and now I get a 64-bit thing. So this is just something to be at least aware of so that someday when you're like trying to open up some DLL that's imported by some other thing, and you're using PView, which is a 32-bit binary, you have to recognize that PView will be having its view subverted because it's, you know, not native, it's not a 64-bit binary on a 64-bit system. I guess I should say this is on 64-bit systems, obviously. But. So, the 
wow effect. That's the paper right there. That was, I definitely have run into this at least a couple of times before someone put it out on InfoSec list as papers. Yes. So sysmate, if that's like a virtual path? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like an alias thing that the, the OS internally knows about, that it knows to alias it to the correct thing. So sysnative, if you use that, if you're a 64-bit binary, you'll always, you know, get 64-bit binaries. And if you're a 32-bit binary, you'll always get, you know, 64-bit binaries. All right. So that's, it's a madhouse. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. This is where I would be showing you the proof that the stuff gets changed in memory. But I decide whether I want to do that or whether I want to take the break or how I want to do this. All right. I'll do that after we take the break. So let's take a five minute break. I'm going to get that set up. We'll get the video zoomed in over there. And then I'll just make the argument. I'll, I'll show the real proof that when I say there's the difference between these two pictures, right, on disk, they both point at the same data structure. In memory, the IAT points at the real functions. I'll show this in memory by running WinDebug on a particular execution. Okay, so this is just going to show you quick the uh, proof is in the pudding in terms of uh, the import uh, address table getting changed in memory versus on disk. So. We're going to look at our template. I'm just, I'm only going to look at the template 32.exe. All right, and so looking at its import address table, we can see that at RBA 2000, it has uh, the literal data 2596. And on disk, it's interpreting this as a RBA to, you know, a hint and name. And so this is the import address table at 2000, and the import names table at 2260 has the same thing, 2596, uh, pointing again at the index. Actually, is that the same thing? Yes, it is. Okay, just making sure. All right, so on disk, this has the value 2596. In memory, right now, this breakpoint, so I've started up the thing. It's calling itself hello world instead of uh, template32.exe because it's just a renamed file, and it's, the debugger is pulling that information out of elsewhere in the file. But so I can put into the memory window, hello world, and it'll use that as the base address. I could just you know, copy the base address from down here. It's just simpler to put the name. So the name will be the base plus 2000, right? And we said that's where this import address table is. So right now, the debugger has stopped before the OS has done all of its loading and fixing up and all this extra work that the OS loader does. So it just sort of mapped it into memory, but it hasn't done anything with the import address table. That's why we still see it saying 2596. Now, if I let this thing continue to run, it's going to actually run the executable. The OS loader is going to do its dynamic linking. It's going to hit another breakpoint, and then we see that at offset x2000, instead of that uh, 2596, it's now 76v011f8. That's the result import address table entry where this particular function is. And I can even Confirm that further by copying that address and telling it to try to look up the name for that uh, particular offset. It may or may not work depending on whether we have symbols. But it looks like it did work and it said, okay, well, that address you just gave me, that's the address of kernel32 get current process ID stub. And going back to here, that is indeed what we were looking for. The OS loader did dynamic linking, it mapped in kernel32.dll. It resolved the address of get current process ID. They called it stub over here, but that's just the real behind the scenes name that the symbols uses. And so it just filled in this value in memory versus on disk. Now, if we want just a little extra confirmation, we said the names table continues to point at that you know middle hint and name sort of array, right? So if I go to the names table instead of the import address table, so 2260, uh, we should see that still pointing at that. 2596. 260, was it? There we go. Mm -hmm. Right, so the import names table is still just pointing at the name structures with the hint and string. 